as a church to welcome Pastor George as he comes to preach. What we've been told is the final one in the sermon series of Jesus' Messianic mission here on earth. Glory be to God. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to welcome everybody watching today. I love somebody, wherever you are watching us from. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to welcome you in the house of God. Amen. I'm excited to be here. I've got a word. I've got a word. I've got a word. I've got a word to, uh, this morning. I want to get. I want you to get ready. I want you to get ready. Amen. Wherever you're watching us from, can you let us know? This is Resurrection Sunday. How many are ready for the Word of God? I've got a word. May we glorify Jesus. May Jesus be glorified. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, I'm not going to waste a lot of time. Um, I just want you to help me welcome Jesus. Let's welcome Jesus. Wherever you are, you are watching us. Wherever, whichever part of the world, in America, in Uganda, in Kenya, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Africa, in Australia, I just want us to lift our hands to heaven and give thanks and honor to Jesus. And I also love to thank God for my wife. What a great word encounter. God bless you, my love. You are always a blessing. The light of God is shining on you. Amen. Let's just welcome Jesus. You know this. I can't do nothing without Jesus and without the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Blessed Jesus, I welcome you in this place today. We give you reverence and honor, Lord. Give me, give me a word. Open my eyes of the Spirit. Open the eyes of the spirit of your people. Bless us, Lord, today as we hear the word of God. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place. Without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. God's people, <clears throat> every meeting is important to the Lord. Every meeting is important important unto God. Every meeting is designed to bring revelation knowledge, to bring deliverance. It is designed to bring the presence of God in the lives of people. And I want you to watch out for today because the Lord is going to do some amazing things. And I got a word. Very quick, uh, we know today it is uh, it is an Easter Sunday. It's a day uh, on which Jesus got back from the dead. Remember, he died three days ago. Today is the day that we commemorate, we commemorate the, the resurrection of Jesus. And I've got a word very quick. Can we go very quick into the word of God? Amen and amen. Somebody shout. Wherever you are watching me from, I want you to, don't leave, don't leave. I want you to, Give yourself into this word of God. It's going to change your life. Amen. It's going to bless you beyond measure. Thank you, Jesus. And welcome to Razan Rock Church, Sydney, Australia. Amen. We're excited to be here. And would love to thank everybody that is watching us across all the platforms. May God bless you. Now, very quick, God's people. Let's go to the foundation of scriptures. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord wants me to talk about today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18. And I want you to follow me carefully because I'm going to be teaching the word of God. Let's go to Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18. Amen, somebody. The Bible says, this is Jesus. The Bible says, I am he. That liveth, I'm using KJV. I am he that liveth, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. God's people, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is alive. 
The Lord Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He said it here. Revelations chapter 1 verse 18. I am he that liveth. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. And he says, Amen. And uh, have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. Very quick, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 1, starting from verse 1 to 3. And I'm going to introduce my message today. Let's go into the word of God. The Bible says, the former treat, uh, the former treatise have I made. It's like uh, a brief account. Have I made all oh, Theophilus of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now the one who wrote the book of Acts is Dr. Luke. He was one of the disciples of Jesus. So he wrote the book of Acts as well as the book of Luke. So it's now giving an account here. Let's start again. Acts 1 verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive. Jesus showed himself alive to the apostles. To whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So even before Jesus went back to heaven, he showed himself alive to the disciples after his passion. Are we hearing this? And the not only that, there were so many infallible proofs. You see that? Being seen of many, being seen of them, 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Glory be to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 22. I'm laying down the foundation, and I want you to capture every word of God. I want you to capture scriptures. I want you to hear the word. What God is saying in the word. Because your future is in the word. Your deliverance is in the word. Your destiny is in the word of God. So I want you to fall in love with the word of God. With the scriptures. Are we hearing this? Acts chapter 2, 22 to... Uh, let's start from verse 22. The Bible says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. This is Apostle Peter. He stood up after the Holy Spirit came, he stood up and began to give what he call uh, he began to give uh, the chronicles of Jesus' life and ministry, the history. So he's now speaking here, telling the people, talking about Jesus. Let's go into verse 23. Him, meaning Jesus, him being delivered by the determinant, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him, Jesus whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be ordained of it it was not possible for death to overcome Jesus I'm hearing this even David said it for David speaketh concerning Jesus I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. It was impossible for death 
to overcome Jesus. Jesus never saw corruption. Anybody, when they die, they go into the grave. The body becomes, it decomposes, it becomes manure. The body breaks down. Why? Because of corruption. But David did in the book of Psalm, it, this is a, a quotation from the book of Psalm. He is prophesying concerning Jesus that the Holy One shall not see corruption. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus in the grave. That's what David is saying here. He shall not see corruption. Now let's go to, to verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with countenance. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and the sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ Jesus to sit on his throne. Oh, you don't know what God is saying here. He seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ Jesus, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. You see, his soul, the soul of Jesus was not left into, into hell, neither did his body see corruption. He resurrected from the dead. Now, this is David. You, you guys, you just know David as, as a psalmist. David was a prophet. He prophesied the resurrection of Jesus. He said, the Holy One shall not see corruption. You see, he was prophesying over the resurrection of the Son of God. This is prophets. This is in the book of Psalms. He shall not see corruption. I will hear in the word. Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up. Well, for we are all witnesses. Peter was there when Jesus resurrected from the dead. Verse 3. Therefore, being, being by the right hand of God, be, therefore, being by the right hand of God, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Verse 34. For David is not ascended unto into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. That is where Jesus is. On the right hand of God. You know, when somebody see, when the Bible mentions the right hand of God, that is dominion. He is on the right hand of God. I feel God in this place. May no grass than here. I feel the presence of God. And the Bible says, we are seated together with Jesus Christ of Nazareth on the right hand side of God, above sickness and disease, above any devil, above any demon above any necromancer, above any demonic power, above unclean spirits, above demonic forces of darkness, we are seated with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because he is seated, David was prophesying in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalm. Verse 35, he says, uh, verse 34, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy falls thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, the resurrection of Jesus is going to prick your heart. You see, if you are not moved by the resurrection of Jesus, if you are not moved by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, then there's an issue here. As soon as 
Apostle Peter uh, ministered on the chronicles of the life of Jesus, his burial, his resurrection. The Bible says the people were pricked unto heart. They were, in other words, they were touched. And they said, Men, brethren, what should we do? Verse 8, the Bible says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises unto you, and to your brethren, and to all that are far off, even as men as the Lord our God shall call, including you and me. And with many other words they did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they, they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You see, when you preach Jesus' resurrection, there is salvation of souls. After he ministered the chronicles of the birth of, of the, the burial, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, the Bible says 3,000 gave their life to Jesus the same day. Are we hearing this? God's people, I'm going to get quick now. Today I'm going to minister on a message entitled Seven Effects Seven Effects of the Resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Seven Effects Seven Effects of the Resurrection of Jesus in our lives. What are the effects? What are the things that, that happened after Jesus resurrected from the dead? You're going to understand these things. You're going to know the word of God. You're going to know these things. It's very important. Jesus is alive. We need to be conscious of Jesus being alive. Jesus is not Buddha. Jesus is not Muhammad. Jesus is not uh, by, by, by faith Jesus is none of that Jesus is the Lord of Lords He is the King of Kings He is not in the grave He resurrected from the dead And the reason why He resurrected from the dead Is it, so vital This is what we are going to talk about Seven effects of the resurrection Of Jesus from the dead As we minister this word of God I see somebody resurrecting from anything that has killed your life, anything that has killed your destiny, anything that has killed your spiritual life, anything that has killed, has buried your life, your, your destiny, anything that is trying to destroy your life, anything killing your life, anything trying to take away joy from your life, anything that has corrupted your life, as I minister this word of God, as Jesus resurrected from the grave, you are also coming out. I'm saying you are also doing what? Coming out. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the, you, the, the, first, the first effect of the resurrection of Jesus is the, is the forgiveness of our sins. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, our sins have been forgiven. I don't care how many sins you have committed against God. Come on, somebody. I, I, I'm saying this once again. Sin can become an hindrance to your destiny. Not only sin, but sin, sin guiltness. Some, some of you are so guilt of sin. You see what I'm saying? Now, I want to let you know, as Jesus rose again from the dead, our sins have been forgiven. I don't care about your past. I don't care about your history. Jesus has deleted your past. He has deleted your past. He has deleted your history. You are not the same person you used to be. The Bible says he became sin so that through his righteousness we might, we might be made the righteousness of God. If, if you have to go in the books of heaven, 
There's no one single book that you ever find any wrong record that God has kept. The Bible says he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. And the Bible also says, as far as the heavens are high above the earth, so oh man, I crossed it. So as God removed our sins from us, as the east is far away from the worst, so God has removed the sin away from us. God's people, if you are sin conscious, it is very hard to access the highest level of God's presence. I'm hearing this. You have been forgiven. If you are born again, you are a child of God, you have been forgiven. There is no wrong record that God holds against you. The Bible says he does not keep his anger forever. Are we hearing this? So you got to understand that sin consciousness. Get it off your system. The DNA that you've got is the DNA of Jesus. And that DNA of Jesus is the DNA of his righteousness. You are the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. Created in the image of God. Only if you are walking with Jesus. So, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, one of the effects is that our sins have been forgiven. Our sins have been forgiven. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Seven effects of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Not in his life, in our lives. Ephesians 1, 7. I want you to follow me very carefully. Holy Ghost, thank you, you're in this place. See, the Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. You see, Jesus has redeemed us through his blood. Not only did he buy us back, he didn't only buy us back, but the Bible says, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So God has forgiven us. Not according to what you've done, according to the richness of his grace. His grace is so rich that there is no sin that his grace cannot forgive. So your sins are forgiven. You did some stupid things many years ago. Don't, don't live in that past because Jesus forgave you. He says all the books of heaven, they are new. I'm hearing this. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 43 verse 25. I want to give you the word of God. Isaiah 43 verse 25. Isaiah 43 verse 25. The Bible says here, I even, I, I am he that brought it out thy transgressions for my own sake and do not remember thy sins. You see what I'm saying? God brought it out our transgressions. Not because of our own sake. For his own sake. And then the Bible says it does not even remember one single sin that you have ever committed in your life. So God is not seated up there in heaven thinking about the sins you committed. No. He doesn't look at you that way. It's you who looks at yourself that way. You better begin to look at yourself as the righteousness of God. I'm hearing this. Let's go to the book of Micah chapter 7 verse 19. Or Micah. Micah. Micah is in the Old Testament. It's after the book of Jonah. Micah chapter 7 verse, verse 19. Thank you Jesus. I'm mean, enjoying the word of God. Did I say Micah, Micah? Micah chapter 7 verse 19. Exactly. Micah 17 verse 19. The Bible says. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So all your sins that you ever committed, God has cast them 
under the sea, to the bottom of the sea. Why at the bottom of the sea? So that they cannot be remembered anymore. God does not remember the sin you did yesterday. When you repent, he forgives. I'm hearing this. This is the word of God. Many years ago, one of my church members came to me, two of them. One young girl, I knew she was being troubled. She was saying, do you believe, Bishop, man of God, do you believe God forgives all sins? I said, yes. And I, said, what, what, and I asked her, what, what's the problem? But I knew by the discernment of the Spirit, I knew that the devil was bombarding her of the sins she committed. And this is one of the strategies of the devil. He's going to bring the past against you and trying to make you think like God never forgave you. And that's how many people right now, they are in bondage because of the sins they committed many years ago. I want to let you know this. God is a forgiving father. He forgives the sins. That's why Jesus died and rose again from the dead. Many people, another guy came and he asked me, Bishop, uh, yeah, this guy has been born again, like he's been four years in the Lord. He said to me, do you think God forgives all sins? This is the battle which is out there. I was talking to a pastor many years ago. He contacted us through our ministry. This man was based in the USA, a man of God. He had uh, fallen away from the grace of God and he, he was even sick, very sick. And he, he was wondering if God really can forgive sin because of some of the things he did. That's what the devil does. He will come against you by bombarding you with doubt. Does really God forgive sins? I'm here to tell you this. God forgives sins. It doesn't matter how dirty your sin is. They might be as red as crimson, but when Jesus forgives your sins, they will be whiter than snow. Are you healing the word of God? Let's go to the second effect of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our lives. Number two, the second effect is that when Jesus rose again from the dead, you know something happened. The devil's power got broken. When Jesus rose up from the dead, the devil's power got broken. God, the devil's, don't be scared of any devil or any demon. Child of God, you can't live like that. When Jesus rose again from the dead, one of the things that happened was that the devil's power was broken. The devil does not have power against you. The only thing the devil does, he uses your ignorance. He uses deception. The devil's weapon is deception. It's going to deceive you. But you know, in as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, in as far as the covenant of redemption is concerned, in as far as resurrection is concerned, the devil's power has been broken. So there is no demon from hell. There is no devil who is born yet who can stop you if you understand this. So don't be afraid. Don't fear nothing. The devil uses fear as a weapon. He has no power over you. He may have power to himself, but he does not have power over a child of God. Born of God, born of the Spirit. That's why Jesus, when he rose again from the dead, the devil's power was broken. Let's go to 1 John 3 verse 8. The piece of John, the first letter of John, chapter 3 verse 8. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, He that committed sin is of the devil. That's true. The Bible says, For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, 
The devil cannot work without power. So he uses his demonic power to work. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, Jesus came to destroy the power of the devil. So when he rose again from the dead, the, power, the devil's power was broken. There is no devil that is going to take your life before your time. There is no devil that is going to afflict you with sickness and disease. Because his power has been broken off. There is no devil that is going to keep you oppressed. There is no demon that is going to keep you in bondage. Why? Because when Jesus resurrected from the dead, the devil's power got broken. It is broken. It is broken. It is broken. It is broken. The, the devil's power is broken. Let's go to the second scripture. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 14 to 15. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 14 to 15. I'm giving you the word. We are here for the word of God. Colossians 2. Verse 15. 14 to 15. If you are there, let me read it for you. Leniga manele gizo. Daju vani kata la banales genosto kinisto. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, brought him out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made the shoe of them openly triumphing over them in it, the cross. The other version said, having disarmed all powers of darkness, the Lord Jesus Christ made a public spectacle triumphing over them in the cross. Having disarmed, the devil has been disarmed. Child of God, you got power. You know demon is going to take away your life before uh, before long life. And I prophesy over your life. No demon, no devil from hell can make you poor. I prophesy abundance in your life. I'm hearing this. Blessed Jesus is here. Let's go to Hebrews 2 verse 14 to 15. Hebrews 2 14 to 15. The Bible says, For as much then are the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also, Jesus, he also himself likewise took part of the same, so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. You see, that is the devil. Through his death and the resurrection, he destroyed the power of, of death, the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus did that. So don't be afraid of nothing. Don't be up. Some of you, when you have a headache, you are afraid. Don't be afraid. You got power to live above the devil. You have power to live above the system of this world. There is power you don't know about. I'm hearing this. The third uh, effect of the the third effect of the resurrection of Jesus. The, faith, the, the third effect is a better covenant God established. Remember, there are two covenants. There is a there's a hot covenant, and a, there's a the the new covenant. The hot covenant was based on the law, and when you break one law, you have broken everything, and uh, there was a punishment. They will stone you to death. That is the old covenant. But when Jesus came, he instituted the new covenant. The new covenant is established on the grace of God, on God's grace, and that grace is Jesus. Are we hearing the word? Is this blessing you? So we got a better covenant. Are we hearing this? Yeah. The Bible says a better covenant established on better promises. So we have a covenant with God. 
That's why you are not just a child of God. You are a covenant child of God. In other words, you got a relationship with God based on the covenant which Jesus made with his father through his blood. Let's go to let's go to the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 from verse 31 to 34. Jeremiah 31 31 to 34. See the Bible says here The one, yeah, Jeremiah the one, yeah. it says, Behold, the day has come, says the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And they will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the Unto the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. You see, now this time God was speaking in terms of Israel and Judah, but when Jesus came, the covenant was not between Israel and Judah, it is the Gentiles, you see, because they hardened their hearts. So we got the covenant, so we have a covenant with God through the blood Jesus shed on Calvary. So I'm not just a child of God. Come on. I am a covenant child of God. I have a covenant. Amen. Let's go to the fourth. Let's go to the fourth. Uh, the fourth effect of the resurrection of Jesus in our lives. The fourth effect is that supernatural dominion God granted unto us. Come on, somebody. Supernatural dominion. Somebody, I want you to understand this. You are a child of God. You have dominion in the covenant. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, no demon can touch you. I have dominion. No, no, it's not by assumption. It's something that has been already established. You see? So every one of you, you and me, we got supernatural dominion. So don't be afraid of the devil. Don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of sickness and disease. Don't be afraid of poverty. Don't be afraid of nothing. Because God has given you the supernatural dominion after Jesus resurrected from the dead. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans 6, 14, that thou shalt have dominion over sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Romans 6, verse 14. And when you go into Romans 8.37, the Bible says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. To be a more than conqueror, it means you got supernatural dominion. No demon can stop you. What you say comes to pass. What you declare by the hand of God comes to pass. When you go, let's go into Luke chapter 10 verse 18 to 19. I'm hearing the word of God. We have supernatural dominion. Luke chapter 10 verse, verse 18 to 19. The Bible says. Now let's start from verse 19. And the 70 returned again with joy saying Lord. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold I give unto you power to trade on serpents and the scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you we call that supernatural dominion that is the dominion there is what we call the spirit of dominion wherever you are you are dominating i'm hearing this it is the same spirit which was upon paul 
Are we hearing this? Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 28 from verse 1. Very quick because I want to finish the rest of it. Romans chapter 28 from verse 1 to 6. The Bible says here, And when they were escaped, then they, they knew that the highland was called Melita, Melta, which is Melita, Malta, Melita. And the barbarous people should us no little kindness, for they kindled the fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cord. And when Paul had gathered their bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, and there came a viper, this is a snake, out of the heat, and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous snake, beast, hung on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt, this man is a murderer, whom, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffers not to live. And the Bible says, And he shook off the beast into the fire, and fell, felt no harm. I'll bet they looked, they looked when he, he should have stolen or fallen down dead. Suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. God's people, that is dominion. That is supernatural dominion. You know, as a matter of fact, the snake is basically uh, symbolic of the devil. You see? You, you're going to start shaking off devils off your life. The snake, the viper, it was a venomous viper, came on his hand. And the Bible says he just shook it off. Dominion. You see? Don't be afraid of nothing. you got dominion you don't know about. You'll be shaking things to get off you. That's what it is. We call that supernatural dominion. Nothing kills you. Nothing stops you. You keep on moving forward because you got dominion after Jesus resurrected from the dead. The fifth, the fifth effect of uh, the resurrection of Jesus is deliverance from the power of hell, sin, and death. God granted. We got delivered when Jesus resurrected from the dead. It was symbolic of our resurrection. You see that? Deliver us from the power of hell. So no hell, because, you see, no hell will ever have a say over your life because of resurrection from the dead that Jesus uh, uh, did. You see that? Deliver us from the power of hell, sin and death. God granted. If you believe in Jesus and you live for Jesus, you ain't going to see hell. Because as Jesus rose again from the dead, he gave us the power to live with him eternally. Are we hearing this? Let's go. Let's look at Romans 8 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. The Bible says here, Yes, yes. Romans chapter 8, verse, verse 2. The Bible says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You see, deliverance from, from the law of sin and death. We have been delivered from, from the gates of hell. We ain't gonna go to hell at all because of his resurrection from the dead. The sixth, the sixth, the sixth, uh, the sixth effect of, uh, the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our lives is the assurance of our salvation or eternal life. God's people, if Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, there's no way we can think of heaven, even if we think of eternal life. Now the reason why we are so bold and the reason why we are so adamant, we are so adherent, we are, we are rooted in this thing, we are so resilient in this thing because we know, because Jesus resurrected from the dead. Huh? The very fact that he rose again from the dead is evidence enough that I shall also live. So my hope is based on his resurrection. 
our hope is based on his resurrection. Just the way he rose again from the dead, we shall also live. Are we hearing this? So there is that assurance. So our, our salvation, our redemption, our eternal life is not based on speculation. It is based on the truth that Jesus rose again from the dead. Because he rose again from the dead, we shall live also. That's the reason why. Let's look at uh, John chapter 14 verse 19. And I've got one and I'll be going out of here. I mean, I enjoy the word of God. Yeah. That's where this is the word of God. John 14, verse 19 to 23. The Bible says, Yet a little while the world sees, sees me no more. But ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Because he lives. Jesus is eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Because he lives, we shall also live. So our hope, our hope of uh, redemption of eternal life is based on this truth. Because Jesus lives, we shall also do what? Live. That's why we, that's why we are looking forward to his coming. Be because we know he's no longer in the grave. He rose again from the dead. We know he's coming back. Out here in the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. So our salvation is intact. Let's look at uh, the, 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 last, the last effect the last effect of the resurrection of Jesus our Lord from the dead in our lives was that the Holy Spirit got granted. The Holy Spirit got sent and has now come into our lives. You see, when Jesus rose again from the dead, the Holy Ghost couldn't come until Jesus was glorified, until Jesus was raised, went back to heaven. And then the Holy Ghost came. He told them, go into Jerusalem, go and wait in the upper room until I send you the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. So after they saw him, he went into heaven on the Mount of Olivet, the angel came and said, What are you looking at here, gazing in the sky? The same Jesus who has gone is the same one who's going to come. And they went into Jerusalem. As soon as they went into Jerusalem in the upper room, the Holy Ghost came down, the promise of the Spirit. So the Holy Ghost could not be poured out according to the prophets of Joel 2.28. The Holy Ghost could not be poured out until Jesus had to go back to heaven. Let's go quick to John chapter 7 and I'll be finishing. John chapter 7 verse 37. The Bible says here in the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried saying if any man thirsty let him come unto me and drink he that believeth on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. See, this is the Holy Ghost. But he spake he of the Spirit of God, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was yet not glorified. So after Jesus was glorified, the Bible says the Holy Ghost came. So we are living in the time of the Holy Spirit. That's why you men, when you live life without the Holy Ghost, you are misinformed. We are living in the abundance of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost is here, right now here, as I'm ministering the Word of God. I cannot minister here without Him. He is right here. He is enforcing the Word into your spirit. He is backing the Word into your life. So the Holy Ghost came. That's the last effect of the resurrection of Jesus. So God's people, Jesus is not in the grave. He rose again from the dead. Now, I've come to the end of this, this message. Now, I want you to lift up your hands. And I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to be well, inviting my wife to come and uh, to come and release us in the word of prayer. 
I pray and I declare in the name of Jesus. May the Lord your God resurrect anything that has gone missing in your life. I command and I declare if you are sick, your body will be healed in Jesus' name. If you are confused, I command the peace in your life. If you are under some satanic oppression, I command deliverance over your life in the name of Jesus. If, you're, if, 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 if you are backslidden, you are fallen from the grace of God, I command and I declare in the name of being dedicated back to Jesus. If you are not born again, you want Jesus to come into your life, I pray and I declare that may the Lord save you from any form of sin in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God's people, that was the word of God about the resurrection Sunday. And I pray that many things will resurrect. Anything that has gone wrong in your life, the Lord is going to restore them back. In the name of Jesus. Now, God's people, will you uh, help me welcome my wife to come and release us in a word of prayer? God bless you and I love you. My love, God bless you. Thank you, Pastor George, and thank you, God, for today's message that you gave him to preach. I want to end today's service with a priestly blessing found in Numbers chapter 6. God's word says, The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Dear me, Father, we thank you that you are always with us. And we thank you that you continue to teach us, to show us, and help us to grow, not only in love of you, but knowledge of you and understanding. Help us to use what you've given us, to reach out to those who don't know you, to build up and encourage those who do, and to be able to be good stewards and lights in this world for you. We thank you and praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, I pray that you are blessed and are affected by the enormity of what God, what Jesus, did on the cross for us this Easter.